What do Macklemore, Cutie Pie, and Fifty Shades of Grey all have in common? They can only have existed because of modern software. Software is a big topic in computing. Without software, your computer or your smartphone would just be a useless box of very expensive switches. And that's because computers are what we call a general purpose machine. They're not really made with a purpose in mind, right? All they do is implement logic using magnetism, optics, and voltage. It's software that gives the hardware purpose. Right? All those programs on your computer or on your smartphone that tell the hardware what to do, how to do it, uh, so that you can accomplish your goals and tasks and things that you need to have done. Now, people generally divide software into two different categories. All right? One is system software, the other is application software. Uh, system software we'll talk about another week. It essentially is all the programs that exist in order to make your machine run. All right. The focus of system software is sort of the operation of your actual computer. Application software, on the other hand, is focused on what you want to do. It's all of the programs on your computer or on your smartphone or whatever, your tablet, that allow you to do the things that you need to do at work, the things that you want to do when you're just home on the weekend, anything that is sort of centered around your needs, goals, and desires, that's application software. And today, we are just going to be talking about application software. I mean, even the name application, or as the young hip people call them now, apps, right? That name application comes from the idea of the general purpose machine. The idea of the machine that's designed to do nothing until you give it an application. Something that it can actually do. Now, there are sort of four trends I want to focus on. One is cloud computing, kind of a buzz term. The other one is software as a service. And then I'd like to talk about the changes that are happening in business software and the changes that are happening in creative software. Now, cloud computing sounds really fancy, all right? And that's because cloud has become sort of a buzzword. You hear it in commercials, you hear it you know, on the internet or anywhere you go. Your people are talking about the cloud. But all the cloud really means is just the internet. Right? It's an abstraction. It's the idea that you can put stuff on the internet and wherever you are you can grab stuff down from the internet like it was a cloud. Uh, but it's not actually a cloud. It's a server. Machines connected by wires hopefully to your machine whether that's your computer at home or your smartphone on the road. And so when we talk about cloud computing, all we're really talking about is taking the files and programs that you would normally have installed on your computer at home and putting them on the internet so that you can access them through either a web browser or using some sort of an app on a mobile device. And there are lots of examples. Uh, Google Drive, which allows you to access uh, word processing spreadsheets and presentations uh, all on the cloud. Or Microsoft's Office 365, which is their version of Office put on the cloud as opposed to being something you would install on your computer at home. But there are others, things you probably haven't heard of, that are usually tied to businesses, like Salesforce, that allows people to access all of their client data from wherever they are in the world, whatever hotel room or airport, so they can do business on the run. And all of this is only possible because we have faster internet connections, right? That's the bottleneck in the system with cloud computing. It's your actual connection to the internet. How fast is that or how slow is that? And even though we're getting faster and faster connections, with current technology, you still take a performance hit whenever you do something on the cloud. And so it works fine for things like client data, right, which is just text. But it, it still gets bogged down when you try to do something more complicated. I mean, at this point, Netflix is about the limit of our ability in cloud computing, right? When you think about it, Netflix stores all the files. They really do all the effort of processing and playing. They just send the output to your device, right? And people have talked about doing things like putting video games online so that you wouldn't actually have to buy a computer that, or a game console that would sit under your television, right? You would just have something that connects to a server somewhere on the cloud and allow you to play games. The problem is, is that you have that performance hit. We're just not quite there yet. But as internet speeds increase, we're gonna be able to do more and more on the cloud. But performance is not the cloud's only issue, right? The other big issue facing people is privacy. 
The idea that when you store all these files on the cloud, who owns those files and who has the right to look at those files, right? If you're at a company where you're working on the next big project, if that information leaks, I mean, that could potentially tip off competitors so that they can create a competing product and get it out before you. Or it could possibly affect people's expectations of the forecast for your stock price. It could actually change the value of your company. I mean, for really big companies, information is really valuable. And the idea of storing that on the internet somewhere, trusting another company to you know, make sure that they keep it private, that's all a little bit too much trust, right? And they'd rather handle that stuff internally and not use the cloud. But for a lot of other people, the benefits, the convenience of being able to share and collaborate over the internet actually make it worth it. And they choose to use cloud services as opposed to actually installing software and doing stuff locally. And because we have these cloud technologies, right, that allows businesses, particularly software companies, right, that would normally sell you a product, right, a, a program encoded on a plastic disc that you would go to Best Buy and purchase, it allows them to think of their business model in a slightly different way, that instead of selling software as a product, they could instead sell software as a service, right? It's not something that you own, it's something that you use, that they run on their servers and you simply access using your web browser or a mobile device, right? But you're paying not for the product to own it, but you're paying for the right to be able to use the product, right? You're paying for the service. And that has some advantages for software companies. Now, there are lots of reasons why a software company might want to switch to a software as a service business model. But one that can't be overstated enough is its effect on piracy. Right, the idea that you can authenticate users using an account with a username and a password or some other form of token to identify that person, right? That means that they can't just give their account to everybody. Like if they give away their account, they're also giving away their files and their private information. It has a dramatic effect on the idea of piracy. If I have Microsoft Office, well, I could take that and I could share it online using some sort of a peer-to-peer -peer sharing service. But if I just have an account to Office 365, well, I'm not gonna give out my account information because I'm not just giving you the program. I'm also giving you access to all of my files, all of my data, right? That's scary for me, I'm losing something. And so while it might still exist that people will share their account with friends or family, uh, which might actually violate the terms of service for the, for the service that they're purchasing, that's still such a small problem in comparison to piracy today. I mean, right now, it's estimated that 43% of all software on all computers worldwide is pirated. 43%. Now, in the U.S., that number's lower. It's about 20%. But overall, it costs companies worldwide over $50 billion in lost profits because people are just sharing stuff for free online. And that's a problem that a lot of companies would be willing to switch their business model in order to solve. And many people, including myself, are predicting that in the future, the idea of buying and installing software as a standalone product that doesn't require an internet connection and doesn't require you to authenticate to some sort of an account is probably gonna disappear entirely. Um, and that's just because it makes so much sense for businesses to avoid the, those losses due to piracy uh, by just charging people for a service as opposed to selling them the whole product um, and trusting that they won't share it with somebody else. Now, business software has been around for a long, long time. And in fact, Microsoft Office, which is one of the best known suites of business applications, is something that we study in the lab portion of this course. But all of these changes that have been happening with cloud computing and software as a service have been really making some changes to the way we use business and productivity software. Because of the cloud, we can keep client information, contact information, calendar information, all sorts of things with us wherever we are in the world, right? From hotel rooms and airports and God knows where, right? You can still be working and doing business. 
These changes are changing the way that we do business and the way we work. We have more telecommuters than ever before. Now telecommuting, telecommuting is just a fancy word meaning that you're commuting to work using you know, wires in the internet as opposed to a car and actually driving into a physical office. Right? People aren't working necessarily in an office or in a cubicle. They're working from home or they're working from hotel rooms or they're working from Starbucks. They're, you know, they're not tied to a physical location in order to do work. Now, this saves money and makes it easier for employees who no longer have to get into their car and put on a suit and a tie and actually drive to work, you know, and traffic and all that sort of stuff. But it also saves money for employers who can now use their office space more efficiently, right? They don't actually have to plan on everybody being in the office all at the same time. Um, but it also saves them money in terms of travel, right? A lot of companies hire people from all over the nation. And so getting them, you know, flying them into meetings and flying them from place to place and moving them can cost a lot of money. And so it saves a lot of money to just have them use video conferencing tools and other tools to work together from afar. And while this may not affect many of us, we can't have this conversation without talking about the beneficial effect this is having on people with disabilities who might have impaired movement and it might be hard for them to get into an office from eight to five every day, but who can still contribute in real and valuable ways to a company. And it opens up a new segment of the talent pool that previously may not have been available, right? People who can be great accountants, but who maybe it's just harder for them to actually get into an office and sit in a cubicle all day. And finally, we are seeing a huge boom in creative applications, right? Creative software. It is easier than ever to create digital versions of books and photographs, music, movies, websites. And we're really seeing the next generation, right? Next generation from my perspective, the millennial generation, take off and become a generation of content creators rather than just content consumers. And I may be stealing my thunder for a future uh, lecture, but that's even more powerful when you combine those creative software tools with digital forms of distribution, like iTunes and Amazon.com and uh, YouTube. I mean, simple video editing software, like Apple's iMovie or Microsoft's Movie Maker, right? Or even more professional programs like Adobe Premiere or Apple's Final Cut Pro. They allow you to take video footage that you're shooting with uh, simple cameras or even your smartphone, which probably shoots HD video at this point, and taking you know, that raw footage and blending it together with music and effects and great editing cuts to tell a story and to do something sort of that you couldn't have done before. And people are creating movies and music videos. They're creating sports demo reels. A lot of people are putting those videos on YouTube. Right? YouTube is a great source of distribution for these homemade videos. And people are actually becoming minor celebrities, right? YouTube has a, a program called their partner program where they'll actually share ad revenue for ads that are associated with your videos. And because of that, there are over a thousand people who are making six figure incomes just by creating videos and putting them online. And there are also programs like GarageBand by Apple or Sony's Acid or the free open source Audacity that allow you to create your own music, right? If you're a performer, if you know how to play a musical instrument, if you're just somebody who wants to create a podcast, sort of a talk show style comedy show or something, you can create those audio files using this software that's either free or very cheap to get access to. Uh, and with just that and a little bit of knowledge of good recording techniques, I mean, you can take that and then put it into the iTunes store. You can actually sell your music direct, digitally, straight from you to your fans. And although you may not sell as many albums as you would if you used a major record label, you're going to get to keep a lot more of the money than you would get from a major record company. And these forms of digital distribution work. One of the great success stories in music is Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, who completely independently created their album, The Heist, using a lot of these digital tools that I'm talking about, along with some people who knew how to actually record. Um, just a little bit of knowledge and tools that are cheaper than they've ever been in the past allowed them to create an album that went on to become a huge success. 
I mean, regardless of what you think of their music personally, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis were one of the first bands in over two decades to create an album without a major record label and get it to go to number one on the Billboard charts. That's something that just doesn't happen or didn't happen very often in the past. And now we're beginning to see it because of these cheap digital creative tools that are available to everybody. Oh yeah, and because they also cobbled together a video about a thrift store and put it on YouTube and got over 500 million views. And there are similar tools for creating digital books, websites, and beautiful photographs. Because of creative software, it's easier for you to get your creations, your work, out to an audience than it ever has been in the past, right? But because so many people are doing it, that also means that there's a lot of noise out there. And you've got to do something special in order to get your voice heard above all of that noise. Having something interesting, important, or compelling to say, well, that only comes from living life and being able to authentically share your experiences with other people in a way that they can connect with. And I don't think there's a class in the world that can teach you how to do that.